Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the tutorial Audio and Acoustic Signal Processing, the quest for high fidelity continues. Now, I don't know who of you was in the keynote yesterday around lunchtime. Everybody or some of you not? Basically, because there will be some overlap. Uh, and you'll find that right on when I start with this first story. Uh, Edison's phonograph and listening tests, who hasn't heard about these? <laughs> okay, we'll be a bit faster, I think, <laughs> if I leave out that story. Because that's just the introduction and then there's a lot of topics on this list, but the ones I'll touch on with most details are audio coding on one hand. And in fact, in this area, I think we'll uh, include a question and answer because uh, there's so many, many additional topics. I didn't bring all my slides from the lectures with me, but I remember enough that I could uh, explain some additional ideas from audio coding. So the slides will just cover some very basics, but through the years from basically 1990 to work finalized this year. Uh, and again, there's so much detail so you can ask questions. And the other of the Big topics in this lecture will be music information retrieval. That's uh, explaining some of the tools people use to let the computer listen to audio, to understand music to the point where today we can do quite a good job on automatic transcription from polyphonic music to scores again. There will be more about immersive audio and in the end, uh, again in more detail, something I touched on already yesterday, uh, what are we missing in our knowledge about hearing and giving example of some relatively recent results already a couple of years old again. And yes, I got a lot of help and some slides from other people, so I want to say thank you to these people. James D. Johnston, Cole JJ, formerly at AT&T Bell Labs. Dima de Vries, formerly at Delft Technical University. Walter Kellerman, uh, still and for some time to go at Erlangen University and of course a number of colleagues from Ilmenau. Okay, that's the point everybody uh, got yesterday, the demo and the listening test. So the high fidelity sound of a hundred years ago. And to elaborate a little bit on that, I told you about the listening tests. This was part of a marketing campaign, which was not successful. Edison really uh, put a lot of emphasis on audio quality to tell people, look, you can't distinguish, it's great, it's the same audio you can listen, whether it's live music or reproduced. But there were competitors quite early on. In fact, the first discs, not yet vinyl, but discs. And these people had a better idea. They said, oh, you can listen to this great artist and had the picture on the artists on the sleeves. And that sold many more systems, many more records than just the high quality. So something to remember for us uh, in the consumer electronics industry, how you package things 
and the experience you give to people, the experience to listen to a certain famous singer is more important than just the technical data. Since we are all here technical people, I think that's good to remember. To have the best quality is not enough. Okay, again, would that work today? With doing a blind test with a live cellist and uh, the recording with today's possibilities of recording, high resolution audio and whatever people call it. If we do really this, try to recreate the sound in a room, it's still difficult. So from time to time people do such experiments and the result is still no a single singer at a certain point, maybe yes, but everything else. There's clearly some details we are missing in the audio reproduction. And that's the question of sound in rooms, where there's currently the most development and here at IFA the most products you can see already. Uh, but as in other cases, uh, when it's scaled down to work in an AV receiver uh, costing 500 or 1,000 euros, it's the expensive class, but still everything is boiled down to a point where uh, you don't get the full promise of these new technologies. Okay. Now, let me get to that. Where is high fidelity technology today? So, speaking in dynamic range, good microphones can do 120 decibel. In fact, uh, some claim they can do even more. Um, I have still a little bit of doubt whether we run into thermal noise at some point. Uh, because, as you know, there's physics depending on the resistance of some circuit, we always have noise. A to D's, D to A's. Um, it's not that long ago that people struggled to get to real 16-bit. In fact, there were 16-bit converters on the market and I remember one conference where people looked at the spec sheet and asked someone presenting uh, their new D2A receivers, oh, if I look at the spec sheet, in reality, it's more like 14 uh, bit and not 16 bit. And the answer was yes, but of course we need to say 16. Now, since we got Sigma Delta converters, things got much better. In fact, the only problem there is, together with the filters, if not designed right, we might get instabilities, but in practice, of course, that problem would show up very early in the design stage. So today, uh, if we have people claiming on their spec sheet 24 bit of resolution, uh, we know that in terms of linearity, that's really there. Um, of course, we have to be careful what to do. And in fact, speaking about A to D and D to A, um, there are some pitfalls which people now know for quite some decades and others which are still unknown to some people, uh, like, uh, Let me do that a little bit interactive. What do you think can go wrong uh, if on paper you have a good A to D or D to A converter, still somebody hears some sound which should not be there. What can go wrong? Any idea? Two possibilities. Sorry? No, that wouldn't, any, nobody would do that today. <laughs> 
usually do uh, oversampling by quite some factor with sigma delta and so on. So that's that's a problem of the past. No, one thing is missing differ, but of course people know that today as well. We have all this nice model that an A to D converter is an ideal converter plus a noise source, quantization noise. If you are in the range uh, of a few least significant bits of amplitude, then the model assumption of an statistically independent noise source is no longer correct. And if you look to the spectrum of the difference signal, the actual quantization noise, you'll find it's not nice noise, but it's really correlated with the signal. It's, as you know, at one LSB, every sine wave, that way gets changed into a rectangular wave. And rectangular, you know, has a lot of harmonics, and that means you get a lot of harmonic distortion. It sounds distorted. That's what happens if you just do A to D. And the rather old idea, and today it's well known, and in one way or another built into the systems, is to add some noise, which, if done in the right way, gives you back a signal with more noise, of course, you add noise energy into the system, but that can actually be modeled as a perfectly linear system plus noise. So it sounds much nicer. So that's this very well known for everybody who is in the audio field dealing with A to D. Um, there's another problem showing up, in fact, uh, with reproduction, especially of low bitrate audio coded material. And that's on the other side of the decibel scale. Remember, today we always have a synthesis filter. We always uh, have, in the end, some filter to get rid of all the harmonics above 20 kilohertz, for example, or depending what system you have. And these filters, and if you are too near to the maximum amplitude of a signal, can give you clipping artifacts. And uh, this has been quite some discussion and different of the companies uh, using low bitrate compressed audio uh, have done better or worse work to avoid this. So what I got told was uh, with all the Apple devices, that's fine. They knew about the problem and did their uh, decoding in a way that there's still some uh, amplitude left so you don't get clipping. But other devices can give you very audible distortion with very loud signals if decoded. And again, that's not a problem of the audio codecs themselves or the other ideas, it's just the combination. That the filter gives you overshoot and the overshoot gives you cl clipping. <coughs> so, there are things people can do wrong, but <coughs> if all is done well, then, yeah. <coughs> uh, it's fine, we get very high frequency output, we get 24 bit of resolution, we get amplifiers, which nowadays <coughs> are linear to measurement accuracy, sometimes up to hundreds of kilohertz. Of course, there are other devices which have much higher distortion values, like loudspeakers. Loudspeakers at low frequencies. Um, usually the rated output power is at 10% um, harmonic distortion. 
which can be audible depending on the signal. can be quite audible. Of course, uh, all this is always a bit more complicated depending on what types of signals you have, whether something's audible or not. We all know in the old times with tape recording we had high amounts of harmonic noise and still people liked the uh, signal. <coughs> but yes, <coughs> there are um, parts in the whole chain of equipment which have higher deviation from the actual uh, ideal. Now, room acoustics, and room acoustics and loudspeaker quality, of course, is where we still have the most room to improve. We can do quite something, but okay. So, uh, we are not at the high-end trade show, but at IFA, but still you can see quite some of this here around. Remember, there we will get to how we can listen to music, uh, how all that works. And over the years, there were quite some moves, quite some stories about what you need to get the highest qualities uh, sent around. One is, of course, we are told by many companies, even here at the exhibition, like, we need high-res audio. We need every part of the system capable of getting us at least 40 kilohertz signal bandwidth, if not 100 kilohertz, and it's clearly audible. It's not clearly audible. So, in fact, people have done experiments on low pass and at what low pass uh, cutoff frequency people can actually distinguish the low pass filter signal from the original. Um, up to a few years ago, um, I was aware of two types of experiments. A lot of experiments did everything probably and found out that at least in complicated polyphonic music, uh, whether you filter to 16 kilohertz or anything uh, higher, no audible difference. At least none which people could find in the statistics of a test, of a probably conducted test. And then there were tests where people just had the wrong conditions. Like I remember a long time ago, uh, at a university lab in Japan. They were working on high-res audio, so they had two uh, loudspeakers, uh, two recording devices, two different amplifiers and D2A converters, and they switched that on and that on and say, you can hear the difference. Yes, of course. Already the difference uh, in position between the loudspeakers makes an audible difference. The difference in D2A converters probably has more of an influence than the actual uh, low pass frequency and so on and so on. Recently, in the last years, a few tests have been done which show that there are few people, even with selected test subjects, they couldn't do any test where everybody could hear it. Always only a very small sample of people could just distinguish between 16 kilohertz low pass and 20 kilohertz low pass. Just very small, very minor difference. So. You know, if anybody is selling you this frequency is necessary, uh, it's what people in the US call snake oil. <laughs> but there's one effect which was underestimated for a long time. If you do a cut-off filter, 
which is very steep, like you can easily do in digital times. Then, as you know from your engineering training, sharp in frequency means long in time. You get something which in all decoding sometimes is called pre-echo, at least uh, you get a different playback signal. And with good loudspeakers who are very accurate in their face response, you might be able to hear that. And this is no contradiction to the higher frequencies not audible. Remember, with the Nyquist criterion, we can exactly in phase and in time reproduce a signal if we have the right filter. So what is correct is that you should avoid the concatenation of filters because every time you do a filter at the same frequency with the same cutoff frequencies, you make it steeper in the end. And then you might run into this problem. So I fully advocate to use higher sampling frequencies in the studio for recording. That all makes a lot of sense. But for the end user, the final emission format, it's a good selling argument for everybody who thinks that 40 is better than 20 by definition. It's not necessarily so. Uh, anyway, we got even other equipment sold. Not so much here, but you remember these cables, not just the cables from your amplifier to the loudspeakers, but the cables connecting your amplifier to the mains. And again, you can get claims clearly audible. You need to spend 2,000 euros for that cable, otherwise you destroy your sound quality. There was a story long time ago which started out as a joke on some of the internet fora, at that time still net news. Um, somebody thought, okay, all these high, freq um, high fidelity enthusiasts, I have a nice story for you. And he claimed, okay, for CDs new at that time, if you take a green marker and you have some of this green ink around the edges of your CD, that will influence the laser pick up in a way that the sound is smoother, not so digital. <laughs> this started out as a joke. There was some time, people knew it was a joke, nothing. Some time later, somebody found that posting. They had thought, okay, I have to test it. Tested it, told his friends. So it re-emerged as, I have tested it, and yes, it really sounds better. <laughs> and a couple of months later, I remember, uh, late at night I was walking in the streets, I think it was Stockholm, for some tests, and I saw green marker for CDs sold for 10 times the price of a usual green marker. <laughs> and I think I woke up a few people from my laughter. <laughs> so that's what happens in this area. But one thing is very important, and we'll get to that in a minute. People who believe in these ideas, you can't and shouldn't tell them this is not true and there is no increase in quality. Because quality is something subjective. Quality is what you feel in the end. Of course, you have the technical parameters, but we all very know that these not always translate directly into subject experience quality. Quality of experience, in fact, is some term uh, used a lot these days. And this quality of experience 
is influenced by more parameters than just the actual audio signal. And yeah, I'll do this now to make that point. Who of you has seen and heard the McGurk effect? No. You have? Sorry? Yesterday? No. Yesterday I, I just talk, talked about it, but it didn't play it. Now I will play it. So, there is unfortunately bad video quality, but there's a picture of somebody just speaking some syllables. So please look at him and at the same time figure out what syllables he's talking about. Ba 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 ba. Once more, look at him. Ba 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 ba. Okay, what syllable? What did you hear? Hmm? Uh, uh, any, anybody under the Gaga? Gaga. <laughs> he said Gaga. Anything else? Okay, now close your eyes and listen again. Ba 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 ba. And now? Baba, yes, correct. So that's what I talked about yesterday. Seeing influences what we are hearing. So we see him talk and we hear, at least depending on country, it doesn't work for everybody the same way, but in a lot of cases, people hear a different syllables when they have the eyes closed compared to when they have them opened. And I played this demo to a lot of tone masters at one conference and for them it was an eye opener <laughs> because they rely on their ears and that they can be trapped into hearing something else was something of a problem for them. In fact, no, they, but they understood the idea. So keep that in mind. And again, I think I said it yesterday is the same way. Uh, the mathematical corollary to that is if you build some hi fi, high fidelity equipment and it's well designed, it looks nice, it will sound better. Design makes it sound better. Of course, that will go away once you do blind listening tests. But if you see it, it's not a minor thing. It's really, as you heard, something which can deceive you quite a bit. And from our experiences, nobody can escape. Sometimes the most trained listeners get into this type of, oh, I hear something different as well. Um, did I talk about the disk at last AES yesterday? No. Another example for that, at the last AES show there was a demo and a paper by people in the UK who did um, let people compare between vinyl disc and CD. And what the people taking part in that test didn't know was that the vinyl disc had just some signal on it to synchronize the data. So when you put the needle into the groove, you got as usual, a little bit of scratching noise. And then it switched uh, over to exactly the same signal as from the CD. 
So, in reality, they heard the same signal. In the test, they had more than 60% of the lins listeners and from the number of listeners clearly statistically significant who preferred the vinyl to the CD. <laughs> Same signal, seeing vinyl makes you think it sounds better. Okay, but if we go back to how our ears work, um, yeah, probably, I don't know, at least some basic knowledge of audio, I think, is here even uh, with the video people. So, you know, <laughs> we got uh, our so-called absolute threshold of hearing, which is the faintest signal we can just detect in silence. I will shortly give an example of masking. There is binaural masking, and then, and that's the figure I showed yesterday as well, uh, all these signals go into the brain. So one thing, uh, recently with more and more people saying, oh, compressed audio is so bad. In fact, interestingly enough, it's only bad if they know it's compressed audio. There are other systems who use low bitrate coded audio, which for these people is perfectly fine. But if they know it's MP3, it must be horrible. <laughs> um, so uh, we got all these uh, analysis chain in our brain. And very important, we got feedback loops. So, in the end, just to make that point again, what we expect influences what we hear. And that goes, in fact, back with some physical changes, even into the ear. The way the ear can actually cope with 100 plus decibel of dynamic range. And that's the range we have between the uh, <clears throat> lowest amplitude signals we can just hear and something loud which still does not damage our hearing. That's interesting. The dynamic range of the actual inner hair cells, the ones which are connected to the neurons and make them firing, is just 30 decibel. The outer hair cells get a signal from the brain, and these signals, on the one hand, influence the actual listening to different frequencies uh, over the cochlea. So, to repeat that, uh, in the inner ear on the cochlea, we have a mechanical system which was free-floating on one end, connected uh, to the so-called window on the other hand. And if you do the mechanics, mechanics was never my favorite subject, but people have done that and it's well known. If you do the calculations for that, you see you get the sound waves in, it's traveling waves on the cochlea and depending on the frequencies, you get a maximum deviation at some point. So in that way, our ears have a spectrum analyzer. And the outer hair cells help to make that tuning curve sharper. So there's some active component. And they stiffen for louder signals. So that's uh, how we can deal with 100 decibel of dynamic range instead of just 30 decibel. This takes a little bit of time. So that gives you one rule of thumb for hearing damage. Everything loud and sudden 
is much more dangerous than everything just loud. So listening at loud amplitudes over headphone or being in a concert with very high sound pressure levels by itself is only dangerous if it's very, very loud. Okay, 130 decibel, okay. That might destroy your hair cells as well. But even at lower levels, if it's sudden, there's not yet the stiffening, you get an overload to the hair cells and they are mechanically destroyed. So there are pictures of destroyed hair cells and that's a problem. Some of these hearing damage overall is much more complicated, but that type of damage can't be repaired. It will stay with you forever. And it's, um, I think it's uh, the same as we have in the pre echoes, so it's a few milliseconds. few milliseconds, one millisecond, two milliseconds, something like that. So that's important to keep in mind. We have a feedback system, active system, and again, sudden sounds are more dangerous than others. So there have been lots of uh, tests uh, of people from different professions. So we know if you ever do shooting without uh, protecting your ears, that's dangerous. Fireworks are dangerous. In the symphony orchestra, uh, the percussion and the people sitting directly in front of the percussion, they have the largest percentage of hearing damages of people in an orchestra. And the symphony orchestra by itself has quite high sound pressure levels. Don't forget that. That would be in other places uh, beyond the allowed uh, noise level. Okay, we had the McGurk effect. So let's go to an application of some of these. Let's go to audio coding. <clears throat> and yes, I don't think I need to remind anybody here. <clears throat> that uh, audio coding helped to change the business model in the music world. Now, at least in some uh, countries, more than 50% of the music sold see, is via so-called non-physical distribution. Uh, the old uh, idea of having an MP3 player, they, they are not that many sold anymore because you got the capability to decode MP3 everywhere. And there's a rough estimate that it's some seven or eight billion devices these days. Okay, just for a little bit of history, you can ask me more about the history. I'm always happy to talk about the old times. Um, in the early 80s, while there were some first attempts to do low bitrate coding of audio signals, as we know it, and especially of high quality audio signals. Um, I remember one reference was the textbook by uh, Giant and Knoll on uh, coding uh, of signals. And in its introduction, there was a sentence, okay, we can do such coding for speech, for uh, still image pictures, for video, uh, for high quality audio, not possible. So that was state of the art. When work started at different labs over the world at around the same time, in fact, there was some early work at MIT Lincoln Labs, which not that many people knew. And it couldn't have worked that well because these people didn't know some of the effects. 
But at least it was already the idea to use a filter bank and to use a psychoacoustic model uh, to have a bit assignment and do coding uh, of high bandwidth audio signals. Um, the lines of work which really merged into the MPEG audio and other standards were done in the around early to mid 80s at a number of places in parallel, including in Germany, Duisburg University, Hanover, Munich, but uh, in Erlangen, of course, our group. Uh, then in the US, Murray Hill, again, MIT Lincoln Labs, Cambridge, Tokyo, a number of Japanese companies. I think this list doesn't have Eindhoven, Philips Natlab did some early work and so on. So there were some early tries to get that done. And yeah, at that time we always all, uh, often talked about transparent coding of music signals. Uh, what does transparent mean? As we can say no, transparent by definition is that no listener for no signal at any time should uh, not be able to show any capability of distinguishing an original and a coded signal. Okay, since we know that people's abilities to hear differ and there's a lot of difference depending on the actual audio signals, we can just estimate we need uh, some billion tests to show that some codec is uh, transparent at a certain point in time and next week it might be different. So this, this really doesn't make sense. People settled for something lower. They settled for so-called near transparent and they did some standardized listening tests. In fact, a lot of um, radio broadcasting uh, labs helped in develop these tests, including Swedish radio, BBC, um, CRC in Canada and a few others. And the idea then was, okay, with reasonable tests, there should be at most a very minor difference. Uh, and on average, uh, usually there should be no proven difference for a certain set of test signals. So again, the testing there is really to search for difficult signals for the codex. For the first test done for MPEG audio at uh, Swedish radio, there were some tone masters of Swedish radio uh, having the codex for several weeks and playing different kinds of music to find the weak spots. And I remember that Neil Kilchrist, who at that time was running these efforts at BBC, said, his task is it to break the codex. So we get here in the requirements one clear difference to other areas. In speech coding and other areas, often people talk about naive test subjects. Like they should not be trained to especially find out about the artifacts we get there. In audio coding, we have one uh, general paradigm which relates to the Edison phonograph test in some way. And that is that over time, if you have changes in the signal, artifacts which are above the mask li uh, masking limits, so they are in the audible range, but they are very minor and the people don't, haven't heard them before. It always takes some time until people really learn 
to detect these artifacts. Once you have learned it, unfortunately you can't forget. So the idea, fortunately people found out about that very early, the idea was over time everybody will become a trained listener, so we have to do the tests with trained listeners right away. Okay, so much about audio quality, but talking about uh, compression bitrate reduction, uh, isn't there the easier method to just use the uh, entropy of the signal and remove redundancy and that way get to lower bitrates? There's a little thought experiment for that. Um, my claim is, if you take some random sequence of 16-bit signed integer values, feed them into a D2A converter, you might find people who consider that music, <laughs> or at least part of music. So we can't really exclude musical signals. Of course, there are statistics if you look in the long range. If you analyze hours of music, we still mine some average uh, spectrum, some average uh, statistical parameters. But in the short time, there isn't such a thing as uh, really solid statistics which allows us to do data reduction by just removing redundancy. So we can use these long-term statistics to get help in reducing the bitrate, but we can never get to a guaranteed lower bitrate. And again, something which I think nowadays it should be known to everybody and uh, yeah, you learn in basic computer science or mathematics uh, the necessary uh, elements to understand why. It's very simple, but if you do lossless coding of audio signals, you rely only on the statistics. Then on one hand, you get a worst case performance of a compression factor of one bit less, so a little bit less than one because your fallback is always to signal now I will just send the original values and don't do any mathematics to them, uh, no prediction or whatever people do, no Huffman coding. So with lossless coding for audio you can't guarantee any lower bit rates. You will get to lower bit rates on average, so for storage people use it. So there is the free lossless audio coding, FLAC codec, and there's Apple lossless, and, and a number of other systems. In fact, uh, quite some time ago, it's, it's a point where you can argue whether standardization is necessary, because with lossless coding, you can always transcode to another system. You get your original bits back. But still, there was some work in MPEG on lossless audio coding. <coughs> and from all the literature and from the experiments done there, there seems to be some glass ceiling of an average reduction in data rate of a factor of two for 16-bit audio material. You have always have to say that. For standard CDs, you can get to about an average of two and everything people tried from that, they got very little improvements, very, very little. It always stayed in that range. So this is not a formal proof, but it's quite some evidence that there we have <coughs> the entropy at 8 bit per sample of typical two channel stereo audio material over long time averaged. Short time, you can't guarantee anything. Okay, so we can't use just that to get to our desired factor of two. So the idea, which again was 
discovered at different places in the world around the same time was to use information about the sink, about our human auditory system. So especially the masking effects and the idea is to keep quantization noise if you do some quantization to parts of the signal below the mask threshold. And that's a famous picture redrawn from a book by Professor Swicker. And I think some of you have seen it uh, very often. Uh, I remember conferences where nearly every um, talk had this picture. And this is just an example. We have a typical basic hearing threshold, hearing acuity. So this differs from person to person. In fact, if you take the 10% quartiles where 10% have less sensitivity or 10% have better sensitivity, you already get to some 20 decibel range. So in terms of in signal intensity, it's a factor of 100. So that's how people differ in hear their hearing abilities. It's very clearly, and not just a question of age and losing high frequencies, but even with young people, so you have relatively large differences here. The other effect is masking. Now remember, we have the uh, signal on the cochlea having its maximum at some point, but it's of course not very sharp filter. So with one loud signal, you have a number of other hair cells which move as well. If there's an additional signal with a certain lower amplitude, it will not change the movement of the other hair cells enough to give you any change going into the nerve firing and the brain. That's the physical reason for masking. And that means that if you have narrow band noise, then at the same frequency, uh, it's a relatively small amplitude lower signal, which is not audible anymore. And then going to higher frequencies, this is the inverse of the so-called tuning curve. To higher frequencies, it's broader. To uh, lower frequencies, it's sharper in terms of equivalent filter. But everything below this curve is called mask because it's not audible. And fortunately for everybody working in this field, this is uh, not dependent on the actual test subject. This is depending on the way the hair cells are on the cochlea, and it's the same for everybody. There's, of course, some slight difference if you have dear hearing damage. And if the hair cells which should be moving are missing, then things get changed. And there have been discussions uh, whether these masking effects are different for people with hearing damages. As far as I know, people have tried to find uh, research money to do research into this, but they didn't get it, so we still don't know. <laughs> OK. That's really what you need to build an audio codec. And first, let me give you an old example. Who has heard the 13 dB miracle before? No? Not in one, because I probably played it a 100 times. <laughs> OK, it goes back a long time to just show the basic idea. And it was taking some signal. In this case, it's an excerpt uh, from a CD, Paul Seyman, Graceland, some song. And then we did simulation of white noise, but uh, with the amplitude relative to the actual signal amplitude. So it's modulated white noise. Modulated over time, but it's white noise, so spectrum is flat. And then there was a quite simple 
perceptual model of these basic masking effects and the overall signal-to-noise ratio. In fact, the 13.6 13 decibel here were uh, taken uh, because overall it showed that noise at threshold gives you the 13.6 decibel. And to get you an idea of what's happening, we then go to the actual different signals. Okay, let's get started. Okay, white noise doesn't sound nice. Okay, noise at threshold. Overall, the same amount of noise, just shaped differently. Now let's listen to the noise directly. White noise, again, amplitude modulated over time. The noise following the masking threshold. So this added to the original signal sounds like this. Okay, and from that we get to what's been called the basic paradigm of time frequency domain audio coding. Like masking uh, is more complicated than what I just showed you. But that's the simplest and most prominent effect. We call it masking in frequency domain. We get into some trouble with onsets because there are some time domain effects as well. Uh, remember, for loud signals, we have the outer hair cell stiffening. If the loud signal goes away, it takes some time to reach the full sensitivity again. And that means that after a signal stopping for some time, the ear has not the full sensitivity, so we get so-called post-masking, forward masking. So that's easy to understand. And that time goes up to 50 or 100 milliseconds. So that's uh, exponential decay and this is relatively long. The other part is more difficult to understand. If you have a loud signal, then a signal with lower amplitude just before can be inaudible. So, sounds like a contradiction to causality. Uh, as always, there's a simple explanation. It must have to do with the time the signal needs to be processed in the brain. Very clearly. This is no longer, it can't be explained with the mechanics of the ear. Uh, but, and there are different theories. One is, okay, in the evolution of mankind, loud signals probably meant danger. So it's a good thing to have a fast pass in the brain for the signal saying danger. And the lower amplitude signal then gets neglected because uh, it's been superseded by the loud signal. This works only for very few milliseconds. If you take old books uh, about psychoacoustics, you might be trapped into thinking this is up to 50 milliseconds or so. No, no. 
is in the area of one, two, two, three, four milliseconds. In fact, to hear noise uh, before a loud signal, which is uh, earlier than just one or two milliseconds, is something you need to get trained. A lot of people first don't hear it, and then after training, they get the effect. But you have to be very careful. And in fact, if you compare that to the impulse response uh, of an MP3 encoder, even when it switches to so-called short window mode to get rid of that problem, that's in the order of 10, 20 milliseconds. It's much longer. So that's the reason why MP3 for certain signals never can give you completely clean reproduction. There are some problems left for signals which fast onsets, percussive sounds. And in MPEG audio, early on there was some test signal on a test CD by the European Broadcasting Union, some castanets, and yes, we all listened to these castanets thousands of times. <laughs> Many thousands of times. Okay, this has, of course, influences on the filter bank. Because the basic idea is to have an analysis synthesis system with a filter bank, then some processing, actual data re uh, reduction, and then on the decoder side, you need the filter bank again to get all these signals back to baseband. So you can think of it in terms of modulation and filter banks. You can think of it in terms of transforms as well. So that's part of the mathematic I didn't want to go into detail today. <clears throat> but uh, you know a discrete Fourier tie, uh, transform analysis synthesis system First view of things, if you have a quadratic transform, you do the inverse transform, you get your data back exactly. But on the other hand, if you have a discrete Fourier transform, your base functions are the harmonic components, the sine and cosine terms. And that's basically a modulation of the signal. And then, doing DFT with windowing especially, or some overlap, you have a polyphase structure in the end with an analysis window. So every DFT or DCT based transform coding system at the same time can be viewed as a filter bank with certain properties, mathematical identity. In early years, and I think there are still some books out there which say there are two different ways to do that with filter banks or with transforms. I have a bit problem to say we have different ways to do that if they are mathematically identical. Of course, it's different ways to look at things, but mathematically it's the same. So we came over time to the point where calling this first step a filter bank, whether it's, as people originally uh, in a number of systems used, a discrete Fourier transform with all its possibility to use FFT for fast calculation, or it's a discrete cosine transform, same thing, or a so-called modified discrete cosine transform, which play some tricks with alias terms uh, to have it more efficient. That's still used in a lot of systems. All this can be equated to some kind of filter bank. Usually equal bandwidth, but even that is not necessary. So people have played with many, many different types of filter banks uh, for these systems over the time. <coughs> All the newest systems just use modified discrete cosine transform uh, with a large number of filter banks. 
if we look at examples how many different frequencies we use for analysis, then we have some of the early MPEG standards using 32. Um, then some other systems in use out there, especially in the movie world with 64 DTS. Then MP3 for some political reasons, 576, <laughs> which is 32 by 18, and there's a story behind that. AAC 1024, uh, forgot Dolby Digital original 256, um, Windows Media Audio up to 2048, again switchable. Well, that's a number of uh, elements in there. Early on, we found some people who said, oh, so many filter bank channels to compute, that must be very time consuming. They didn't know FFT. <laughs> With FFT type algorithms, uh, to calculate a DCT is a no-brainer today, but even 15 years ago, it was already a no-brainer. And certainly lower complexity compared to other filter banks with quadratic mirror filters and whatever people tried at that time where they really had to compute the inner product for full filters. Okay, so we got different so-called spectral components. Again, it's really time frequency. We have uh, over time blocks of the signal and then do the filter. We have a more or less simple model of hearing. In fact, one interesting uh, point is that uh, over time, work started with very simple psychoacoustic models because the computing power was not there to do more. Then people tried to model hearing better and better. And then there was the idea, oh, but we need to do 100 times real-time encoding on a PC to do fast encoding. And together with a few other tricks, we went back to simpler psychoacoustic models, still getting nearly no difference in audio quality. So we are now back, in fact, with the psychoacoustic models built into commercial systems, which are very similar to the ones used in the late 80s, in the early research. Then there's a step here, it's called bit or noise allocation. We get information about the just mask signal, the mask threshold, and we use that in different possible ways to actually do a quantization. And again, the rule there is very simple. We've seen that the quantization noise, if kept below the mass threshold, will not be audible. So we do an estimation of the actual mass threshold. Uh, here, we compare that with the actual quantization noise given by the quantizers we use in there. Depending on the systems, uniform quantizer or non-uniform quantizers. And if we are able to keep the quantization noise below this estimated mass threshold, everything is fine. We got quantized samples. We often do additional Huffman encoding, and we are done. In a different picture, it can look like that. And here it says quantization encoding, because we do it usually in one step. We do the quantization, and we use uh, different tricks to get the bit rate uh, further down using the entropy of the signal in the end. So a lot of times Huffman coding is uh, used here. I assume everybody has some basic idea about Huffman coding here. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's a picture drawn by the late Gerhard Stoll. Uh, who worked for IRT at that time. And that's the simplest 
of the MPEG audio codecs. So the filter bank here is one with uh, prototype filter lengths of 511. Uh, so lots of overlap. We go into steps of 32, so we have 32 subbands. Uh, so this is a generalized QMF type filter bank. We get a uniform quantizer. Uh, in German, often the word lineare quantisierer is used, which I fin find doesn't make sense because no quantizer is linear, really. <laughs> of course, you have uniform steps. So uniform quantizer is a better word. And we have a psychoacoustic model. We have a block compounding method uh, of doing the actual coding, which means we have blocks of 12 values in time domain. 12 times 32 gives us 384, that's the frame length for this codec. Uh, and that means we have uh, so-called scale factors. In fact, Dolby Digital does it similar way, and there it's called um, a block floating point exponents, because block compounding is block floating point. We have some value for the amplitude and then the actual mantissas, and all that is formatted. And important here, we have a bit allocation algorithm which allocates, depending on the actual signal, the bits to the different frequencies, 32 here. That translates in a very nice and elegant bitstream description. So if anybody has seen the bitstream descriptions of any of the newer codecs, you can feel, fill hundreds of pages with syntax diagrams. MPEG-1 audio layer 1 fits on half a page. And that already includes intensity coding, so some method to have more efficient coding for two-channel stereo signals. Without that, that would even be simpler. So we start with a bit allocation for each of the 32 frequencies. Then we have the scale factors for each band where the bit allocation is not zero. If it's zero, it means the signal is not transmitted. We don't need to reconstruct anything. We don't need an amplitude. And then we have the actual data from 2 to 15 bits in length. The idea to do stereo encoding here follows some well-known uh, results about spatial hearing. And that is that uh, our ears, our brain, um, uses different cues to determine direction of a sound. And the two most notable cues for binaural hearing, you can do even monaural hearing of directions. That's using head-related transfer functions. But for binaural hearing, uh, the cue uh, really can be um, interaural time differences or phase differences and interaural level differences. So time or phase differences is mean you have a coincidence detector in your brain, finding out which signal comes first and by what time, and that gives you an idea of direction. Interaural level differences means signal coming from one side gets shaded by your head. You get level differences, again, that can be used to determine direction. Now, at lower frequencies, these phase differences are very important and good cue to determine direction. At some point, uh, the size of your head gets into the order of one wavelength. And if you have more than one wavelength in your head, it's no longer unique. You have phase all over. Therefore, phase differences for higher frequencies are no longer used in your ear, and that's where the level differences take over. This means that to reproduce spatial sound, the sound in a room, 
At higher frequencies, the actual phases are not so important, at least for stationary signals. It's not the same for onsets, yeah, it's still important. But for stationary sources, it's enough to have the level. So intensity coding does just that. For the higher frequencies, you get the scale factors, which basically give you the level independent for left and right, but only a single signal for both signals uh, in terms of mantissas. So you have the reproduction signal just scaled the same signal, just scaled in amplitude, only for higher frequencies. And that works quite well, gives you some advantage. You get in trouble with certain signals. And the most uh, famous signal to get you in trouble with that was clapping of many people in a room, because there you get the so-called law of the first wavefront, the precedence effect, which says our brain is trained, if it has the same sound from different directions, to take the direction for the first sound. So timing becomes important. Intensity coding, your timing is no longer accurate. So in intensity coding, your clapping of the full room really goes down to a line in the middle. Doesn't work anymore. So you have to adaptively switch it on and off. But otherwise, that's a nice idea. OK. Jumping to MPEG audio layer 3 later nicknamed mp3 because of the file extension uh, used for these files uh, is a bit more complicated but follows the same basic ideas in fact for purpose of possible compatibility we start with the same filter bank we have a frame length of 1152 samples, which is the same of the frame length of a so-called layer two encoded signal, which I don't mention here. Um, the idea was to ease transcoding. Uh, that's one of the great ideas in standardization, which work out to be not used in the end. But anyway, that's why we have a cascaded filter bank here with the so-called MDCT and the polyphase filter bank as used in layer one, layer two, giving us 576 different frequencies, which can be switched, and that's a specialty of the MDCT. I don't have the time to explain now to 192. So we can have shorter impulse response, which helps us quite a bit with these pre-echo artifacts, where because of the impulse response of the filter bank, you have your quantization noise spread over time, and that becomes audible. That's the problem with castanets I was mentioning. We have a psychoacoustic model. Then we have in the standard, uh, there's different ways to do that, but the standard, as an example, has encoding, which is uh, an analysis by synthesis system. In fact, that idea was taken from speech coders starting around the same time. Calp coding, code excited linear prediction, <coughs> where you do iterative uh, calculation of possibilities until you find the best. The same thing is here. There's a comparison to the actual uh, mask threshold and there's a bit counting because we use a combination of Huffman encoding and non-uniform quantization. So we count the bits to find out uh, whether we exceeded the number of bits available. So with that, you can do constant bit rate encoding while you use Huffman encoding and are very variable in your ideas. And that goes to the actual Huffman coding and bitstream formatting. So that's the short form of MP3. You can ask more questions about it if you want, but that should be enough for now. Now let me just go to some of the newer audio coding standards. AAC. Basically five years later, 
In its uh, first instance, we have different versions in Zen. And there we were able to, on one hand, go to higher computation complexity, and in fact, higher amount of storage necessary. We went to 2,048 samples windows, 1,024 different frequency lines. This block switching to go to a higher time resolution worse frequency resolution is 1 over 8. This time we are near enough to the properties of human hearing that given enough bitrate and a good encoder, there's no longer a problem with castanets. They can be perfectly fine. Uh, we do some other things, okay, like in video encoding, people went from full pixel to half pixel to quarter pixel uh, um, <coughs> calculation. Uh, here we go to half critical bands uh, for the calculation of the psychoacoustic model, and we do more complicated Huffman encoding. Otherwise, same idea, still the reference for the highest quality. What comes later gets to lower bit rates with some compromise, some possible compromise in quality. And the most famous and used a lot for streaming services today is high efficiency AAC. The idea there is to fool the brain by not bringing back the actual samples at high frequencies, but some reconstructed. So we really look at the envelope of the frequency envelope of the signal for the higher frequencies. And the decoder then does some actual decoding of the lower frequencies and uses knowledge from the lower frequencies about harmonic structure and so on to do a synthetic signal at high frequencies, which is shaped like the original signal. That's enough to fool people in most cases. It's not perfect, but it will fool people. Fool people. And there we can uh, relatively good quality stereo at 32 kilobit per second or above. In fact, there are some radio systems in the world who run this at 48. And 48, I would say, is usable. 32, mm, no. <laughs> then, Newest in this is MPEG-H, and I have only a few slides on this. The idea has been to go to systems which really uh, can do spatial reproduction, which gives us much better illusion than just usual two-channel or five-channel stereo material. And the paradigm change, which is in there, which uh, we've been asking for a long time is to go from actual channel-based coding to so-called object-based coding. So you have your full um, symphony orchestra, you have the different sources for different instruments or the instruments groups, and they are transmitted separately, and you do the rendering in the decoder. That's called object-based. Another early idea, and we'll come later to it uh, once more, is to use higher order ambisonics. Ambisonics, if you remember yesterday, is spherical harmonics. So you actually do um, a, time, a series of going to higher orders uh, in geometry, basically for the wave field. That's spherical harmonics. And of course, in MPEG-H, we can use all the formats, like an extension to SAOC, or just so-called legacy content, two-channel, five-channel stereo, and so on. For the playback, the idea is that the system is given knowledge about the actual source format, about the geometry of the playback system and metadata. And from that, there's rendering. If we look to the full system, it 
can look like that. You can have format conversion, you have object renderers, you have SAOC or higher order ambisonics decoders. All that goes either to some virtual layout or is then rendered and mixed to the different channels. Won't go into detail. You can just see it's very complex. <laughs> but it can give you great sound. Okay, I want to uh, stop this first part and then we'll have uh, some coffee. I hope something is off there. <laughs>